Okay, everybody quieting down, let's get started here. Miss Laventus Wells, you want to join us? Hey, Linda, Miss Laventus Wells. Hey, Whit. Linda, come on. You're holding up the. Out of here, no, at least it's not. Where is she at? No, I say, I would say, Linda. And <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and get started, I guess. Uh, thanks everyone for being at our board meeting tonight to the August 23rd board meeting, our first item on the agenda. Mm -hmm is the welcome prayer and the pledge. So if everybody please stand. Uh, Dr. Stiles, you lead us in a prayer, please. May we pray. God of mercy and love, we thank you tonight for a great school opening and for the opportunity to advocate for our families once again. We ask that you be with our students as they begin a new school year. Bless them with the joy of friendships, the excitement of new opportunities, and a deep love for learning. Surround them with your protection, creating a place that is safe to learn, filled with kindness and overflowing with your love. Thank you for our Greenville County teaching family who have given their lives to serve our students. We ask that you bless them and fill them with an abundance of patience, compassion, and love this school year. Help them to speak with wisdom, to act with compassion, to demonstrate kindness in actions and words, and to be a daily blessing to their students. Lastly, we thank you for our administration and staff members who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes throughout the summer to ensure a successful school opening. Thank you for their dedication, commitment, and leadership. Grant them wisdom and strengthen them for continued service. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Ms. Mosley, you have an introduction? I sure do. Thank you, Ms. Um, Tonight, I am very excited to welcome Logan Shuler, who is a fifth grade student at Oakview Elementary School. He's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. A little about Logan. Logan has attended Oakview since kindergarten. He has grown tremendously in all areas, socially, emotionally, academically, over the years at this school, and he is a leader on campus and serves on the safety patrol. His principal notes that Logan is passionate about life and gets excited to learn new things. Logan is accompanied tonight by his parents, Mike and Betsy Schuler, and his sister Blakely, who is a seventh grader I learned at Riverside, and his principal, Dr. Philip Revis. So, um, welcome Logan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Logan. Our next item on the agenda is the adoption of the consent calendar. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is appearance of visitors. Uh, Dr. Stiles. As each speaker's name is called, he or she should proceed to the podium at the end of the board's dais where there is a microphone and light system. Each speaker has up to three minutes to speak to the board. The light system will be green for the first two minutes and will then turn yellow when one minute remains on the speaker's allotted time. In keeping with board policy KCA, abusive language or personal attacks aimed at students or staff members will not be permitted. All speakers are expected to behave in an orderly and respectful manner. The board will not engage in discussion with the speaker or respond to comments. 
The superintendent will designate a member of the staff to respond to each speaker in an appropriate and timely manner. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. Next item, well, no, this item here, let's go to appearance of visitors. First speaker is Jennifer Hausman. the Greenville County School Board. I hope you enjoyed your summer break. I know my family did. I'm here to talk about choices. Um, I was listening to all my daughter's teachers in her class. They were all asking what pronoun she wanted to be called by. They were also asking what pronoun her what her name would like to be called by. Why is this being asked to my child? My child then asked me, why are they asking me this? I said, well, if you want to be called, put, he or, uh, put she or her. Um, is this another way to teach our children that how you want to mold them or how they want to be? Um, I want my child to be the loving, caring person she is. I don't want her to change who she is. She chooses to be who she is. We all have choices. Even us adults have choices. We, I feel as a parent, I've lost choices. My child has lost choices. When are we gonna have our choices back? At what point do things change? I mean, we didn't even get a, a mask this year to opt out of form. We didn't even get a medical form to opt out of things. What? do we do we lost everything our our as an adult as a mom as a student they have no choices anymore pronouns they shouldn't be asked that everybody has a right to choose who he she or her or them want to be college eventually they teach you to be an adult and make your choices so i thank you for listening and have a great evening Thank you, Ms. Osman. Next speaker is Laura Pouch. Hello, board members. My name is Grace Pouch. I'm the wife of a teacher and mom to two kids in Greenville County Schools. As a mom, church member, and friend, I have noticed the sharp increase in emotional suffering like depression and the diminished social health of children in our community, even before COVID. I really appreciate the way you as a board have moved toward getting more counselors into schools and have invested in a curriculum for social and emotional wellness. I truly thank you for that. I'd love to see you expand your response to this crisis with an even broader, multi-pronged approach that takes into account our methodology. First, I'd like to suggest that making recess a guaranteed time for every student every day is really low-hanging fruit. We can do this. The standard's already there. We just need to find out what's keeping it from being implemented. For example, my seventh grader last year, her class ate lunch at their desks and watched YouTube videos alone instead of talking to each other. And the school did not make sure that students had time to run around and talk to each other in recess. No wonder our kids are struggling socially. My second suggestion is not low hanging fruit. It would take a huge shift in the way that we've been operating, but it's absolutely essential. We have got to strike a healthy balance with technology. We need limits on how much time students spend on individual Chromebooks because that learning method is inherently antisocial. It's isolating. The assumption, I believe, is that the digital experience is this great commodity to which we need to provide equitable access, but the real commodity will always be nurturing human interactions. Why would we invest so much time and energy in SEL curriculum that teaches kids about social interaction and then remove the bulk of their opportunities to interact socially? I think we valued academic gains at the cost of other dimensions of a child's growth and development. And that is not helpful. 
So I really value what you've done, but I ask that you please make these two items, recess and healthy limits to digital technology, top priorities this year as you address students' well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pouch. Next speaker is Sasha Patton. Good evening. My name is Sasha Patton. I've spent 14 years as a public educator. I have a master's degree in elementary education, and I'm a licensed teacher. After addressing this board many times in the spring about the scarceness of recess in Greenville County, I've worked diligently over the summer on this issue at the local and state level. My boys are eight and three. My oldest was a second grader in Greenville County Schools last year. The lack of physical activity and social interaction during the school day had a significantly negative impact on his social development and mental health. I'm here tonight as a public advocate for all of our children. In Greenville County, we have 53 elementary schools. Six of these have just 18 minutes of physical activity in a six and a half hour school day. This includes <coughs> recess, movement in the classroom, and the average number of minutes of PE. 27 of our elementary schools have between 20 and 28 minutes of physical activity a day, and 20 of our schools, less than half, get 30 minutes. I've spoken with the district level staff about recess in middle schools too. Folks are convinced that all middle schools are getting one short recess after lunch. This is simply not true. Many parents of middle schoolers are telling me their child doesn't have any recess, none. Unstructured outdoor time has been shown to profoundly support academic learning, mental and physical health, and decrease teacher burnout. It's no coincidence that each of these areas of concern are listed on the 2023 strategic plan here and in the lobby. We have all have the right ideas, but we're missing a critical component. Children need to move frequently and freely outside multiple times throughout the school day. Local experts from Furman and Clemson know this, the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics know this, and our teachers know this. So what's the solution? In the immediate near future, schools can rewrite their schedules to include 30 minutes of outdoor unstructured recess time. State law currently allows time for this. We can also immediately discontinue the use of screen time when indoor recess is necessary. Games on Chromebooks are simply not a substitute for recess and should not be permitted. And lastly, at the state level, we can change State Board of Ed Regulation 43231. If we reduce the required instructional time from six hours a day to five and a half, we'll allow all elementary schools to provide 60 minutes of recess throughout the school day. And here's the best part. You don't need a line item on the budget. There's no funding required. It's just a little bit of legwork to change some policy and a tiny State Board of Ed regulation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Patton. Next speaker, next speaker is Amanda McDougal Scott. <coughs> All right, rapid succession on the uh, recess tonight. So I am Dr. Amanda McDougald Scott, and I want to start my questions today with a question you can ask yourself, so I'm following the rules here. And that is, who among us does not benefit from breaks and opportunities to move around and socialize during the day? So today I'm pre presenting as both a parent and an academic researcher, whose first job in academia was on a study examining the impact of research, of exercise on executive functioning, academic achievement, and overall health among overweight children, with one of our nation's top experts on this topic. I called Dr. Katherine Davis today to consult with her before coming here tonight to make sure that there was nothing I was missing in the field, and I'm coming to you with the best evidence-based recommendations possible. The Society of Behavioral Medicine issued a statement co-authored by Dr. Katherine Davis recommending that elementary school children should be receiving at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise opportunities each day. 
Compared to the maybe 15 to 30 minutes a day for recess our elementary students are receiving each day, there's a large gap between what our experts recommend for our children and what they are receiving. Evidence has indicated that among the benefits of these opportunities for breaks and movement throughout the day included improved academic performance, improved cognition, aerobic fitness, and improved mood. Additionally, improved standardized test scores and grade point averages have been reported as benefits of access to opportunities to engage in more physical activity. Executive functioning can benefit from physical activity breaks with evidence of improved attention to time on task. Research has also provided ample evidence that spending out time outdoors improves our mood and cognition. So with all these reports, it's reasonable to conclude that outdoor recess time and opportunities for movement can provide both physical and psychological benefit. After spending time looking for any report that doesn't place South Carolina public education system among the bottom 10 in the nation, I ask why we cannot find additional time in the school day for a more developmentally appropriate approach to our elementary education. Perhaps increasing access to physical activity, movement, and outdoor time is a great place to start. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. McDougal Scott. Our next speaker is Aaron Nunley. Hello, uh, thank you for having me this evening. My name is Erin Nunley. Uh, I am coming to sort of reintroduce uh, my organization. We were previously Communities and Schools of Greenville, and we are now Communities and Schools of South Carolina. Um, and so I'm the director of programming for that organization. We serve 10 schools throughout Greenville County, mostly in the White Horse Road community. Um, we have 14 really talented site coordinators that provide integrated student supports and case management services to students students in um, all of those schools. Um, so we are just super thankful for your leadership. We're super grateful for your continued partnership and we're really excited to see where this new merge and venture with communities and schools takes us. Thank you, Ms. Dunley. Next speaker is Michael Joey. Hi, uh, I just have three things that I wanted to say. Uh, one is that uh, we are here for our children. And just to remind us of, of that, that is the basis of why we're all here. And to remind us that they're God's children and the gravity of that concept. All right, number two, the Bible reminds us to pray for our leaders. And I want you to know that I pray for you all and, and this whole room. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention is in one of the meetings recently uh, there was a discussion about a book that was being pushed uh, onto the school and, and actually it was already in the school. Um, in reference to that there was a discussion about book burning and why this book couldn't be in there and I want to remind this group that the concepts that related to that book Somebody read some excerpts from it, and it talked about uh, removing women's undergarments and scissoring, and that's not education. That's pornography. Pornography is illegal in our public schools. And that brings me back to praying for this group. So thank you. I yield my time to anybody. Who thank you, Mr. Joel. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is 4.01 Superintendent's Report. Dr. Orster. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Before I, <clears throat> excuse me, before I deliver the Superintendent's Report tonight, I do want to make two introductions. Uh, one is from a sister principal that was approved back in May, and the other was a program director at Fisher Middle School, which was approved in August special call, but they weren't able to be with us at those times. So first I'd like to introduce and recognize Brian Ferguson, I believe he's at the very back of the room. Uh, he is the new, uh, having already started this year, assistant principal at Carolina. 
coming to us. I will not try to pronounce the name of that town in South Dakota because I'm afraid I would not get it correct. Comes to us having been an assistant principal and a Kate director in South Dakota. So welcome to Greenville County School. Welcome to Carolina. We're glad to have you with us. And I believe you might have a family member or two with you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the introduction, Gordon. So, uh, so glad to be here in Greenville County. It's my son Pierce, number six for us. And uh, it's the first grader over at Fort Scholes. So. Well, great. And welcome to you, and, and welcome to you as well, Pierce. Christine Thomas, I think I saw Christine out there, there she is, which you all may recognize from her previous role as an academic specialist for uh, at the district level for career and technical education, but taking on a new role this year, new challenge this year, as the program director slash assistant principal uh, Fisher Middle School. Christine, uh, congratulations on your new role, and you have somebody with you as well? A welcome to him, and again, congratulations on your new role. <laughs> we'll move now into our superintendent's report for this evening. <laughs> it's a uh, maybe a hundred year old tradition or longer that you talk about what you did over the summer break when you come back to school in the fall. So we want to talk a little bit tonight about what we did over the summer break. So most of you, I think, real, realize and recognize that summer's different, not necessarily that much of a break. Uh, for people throughout the district in all roles in the district. So we want to look a little bit tonight at those things that occurred over the summer to prepare schools to be ready to start. And I will say we had an outstanding opening uh, last Monday, one of the best that we've ever had. Uh, so a lot of hard work on the, behalf, on the part of many employees throughout this district. So as you look at some of the preparations, some of them will look familiar to you, haven't been in schools. Some numbers with it though, the maintenance folks in facilities completed 21,605 work orders. They did flooring replacements totaling around 186,000 square feet. They refurbished or replaced 19 gym floors. <clears throat> we contract painted about 1.3 million square feet of surface, put in 158,909 square feet of new roofing, conducted five HVAC replacements, five chiller rebuilds, and moved a total of 11 portable classrooms. They were not only moved and installed, but they were significantly renovated in preparation for their use this year. And they're finishing those up uh, and finished those up last week and this week. Did 15 ADA play area upgrades and completed those, reconditioned and reconstructed five tracks, reconditioned three tennis courts, and installed and expanded two bus loops. Bonds Career Center, we're in the process of relocating the Vista entrance to the front, so actually the front of the building, what used to be years ago, the front of Greenville High, uh, Greer High rather, excuse me. And we're renovating the third floor <clears throat> in anticipation of relocating part of the HSAP so that we would have one on the eastern side of the county and one on the western side of the county, utilizing the current staffing that we have, the program that we operate there, but making it convenient, as you recall, uh, transportation is on the student or the parent when they're reassigned to HSAP. Um, the CTE Innovation Center, construction there is on schedule, and we opened and occupied the new addition at Robert E. Cashin Elementary School. Conducted custodial college, our training session for more than 600 employees, conducted over four days for our building services and custodial employees. Transportation, recertified 600 drivers, aides, and subs, 3,600 total training hours, conducted CDL and bus driver training, <clears throat> training 22 drivers, and 17 coaches to drive and provide extracurricular transportation. Uh, did 10 bus aides to be trained in special needs transportation. Upgraded 500 buses to an eight camera system with 5G Wi-Fi. 
and we conducted our call center transportation conducted 27,000 calls to notify parents of times and locations of bus stops. ETS replaced out of warranty Chromebooks numbering 37,225. Did Wi-Fi upgrades to support high-speed video streaming and new standards in 98, 9.8 million square feet of coverage. Implemented ClassLink, which provides access to over 200 education applications. So a single window, single window access, <coughs> access to those apps. Implemented a new enrollment process, <coughs> excuse me, provided connectivity to support live streaming of athletics to all high school gyms and press boxes. Expanded district radio system coverage to eliminate dead spots. Human resources, hire to rehires process 964, process 1,465 transfers, and remove 951 individuals from active employment. Calculated nearly 5,000 new hourly rates for 26 salary schedules. Finance, initiated 5,600 teacher supply checks, did benefits enrollments for 950 new staff, processed 172 benefit transfers, and processed 185 employee retirements. They calculated 4,977 new hourly rates for 26 salary schedules. Staff and leadership development presented over 1,000 PD sessions primarily those for and attended by teachers. Had 315 first year teachers attending Induction Institute, prepared 11 new principal mentors, prepared 41 new assistant principal mentors, paired 70 gate teachers with coaches, conducted a training for 165 new teacher mentors, and trained 63 teachers and administrators to observe and evaluate teachers. Safety and security, we hired three Evolve technicians and three law enforcement personnel to accompany Evolve systems to schools, and we fully deployed that system effective the first day of school. We also conducted demonstrations in the system to principals, media, and all seven local law enforcement agencies. We had 160 teachers, and 50 out of district educators that participated in a training uh, where we partnered with the Greenville County Sheriff's Office for active shooter on site training <laughs> over the summer. We served as training both for law enforcement agencies and school and school level personnel. Superintendent's Leadership Summit, which is our kickoff for the year with principals. This year, you can see we had this young man as our keynote speaker, Brandon Fleming. You can read there about his personal story. Had an abusive childhood home. He was a teenage drug dealer. He was a college dropout. He attempted suicide. He talked about how his life was changed by adults who believed in him, a coworker who encouraged him to return to college, a professor who tutored and mentored him to succeed academically and an employee at Woodmont High School who mentored him. He has since become a successful debate coach. Hired by Harvard University for its summer debate program, he then founded a pipeline program that trains disadvantaged Atlanta teens and sends them to the Harvard program where they consistently outcompete more, exper more experienced and advantaged debaters. His message, believe in our youth, maintain high expectations, and never give up on any student, which parallels that which we had as the focus, not only with our principals for the beginning of the year, but throughout this year, to expect each student learning and supported to achieve their best. Relate, communicating and listening, positive interactions and cultivating relationships. Engage, connect through intentional classroom and co-curricular activity. In addition to that keynote speaker, principals worked in groups and also had the opportunity to interact with a student panel to reinforce the importance of the roles of teachers, 
administrators, counselors, coaches in developing students and being that inspiration, being that connection that can take an individual like the one they heard speak at the beginning of the session and move them from really a very bleak future into a promising future. And again, emphasizing that at the end of the day, at the end of our students' career, we want to be building better graduates. We want our students to leave with a high school diploma. We want them to possess on their transcript college credit and or industry certification. And a little bit later, in a committee of the whole, we'll share with you uh, some pretty, I think, uh, impressive increases in those areas that we have, we uh, incurred in the last year and are lining ourselves up to repeat that again this year. That concludes the superintendent's report. Those are the things we did to prepare for the 77 plus thousand students coming back this past week. Thank you, Mr. Meek. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Y'all been busy. Next item on the agenda are action items. <coughs> First one's 5.01. Recommended motion coming from the committee of the whole does not need a second is to approve ending ending the IB primary years program at Sarah Collins Elementary School. Any discussion? Ms. Wales. I just uh, want to follow up on a couple of questions. Some of the discussion we had at the committee of the whole just so I'm clear. Um, what resources have we had allocated at the school level and at the district level towards IB that now will not be needed, required? Mr. McCoy. Um, so mostly at the um, elementary level, um, Ms. Wells, that would be in the training, in the dollars, of train, the training dollars that goes associated with IB for professional development. So the, so that was, tar that, that training professional development was IB specific, we have a lot of money specific for that. Okay, certified. And, and then there's dues associated with which you pay each year as well to the IB organization that would be reallocated as well. Okay. And in terms of district staff support, because we... It really is not, we have one person who has that job of overseeing the IB in the magnet school, so that really would not be a change in her, I mean, she still supports. So we're still keeping that full, is that a full FTE? Is that... It's, it's a full FTE at the district level, but she does, that's just one small thing she does compared to her other job responsibilities she has at district level. The, the FTE directly associated with uh, with the school is remaining in place and that's the foreign language teacher. Right, that was the next one I was gonna ask about. Right. So, but, but from the district support standpoint, the person that's doing that work will continue to do that work for the other schools and isn't gonna have an extra thing. I mean, she does do a lot of different things yes, already. Yes, she has so a very not, large, yes, array of things she already does. Yeah, okay. And so then um, the allocation, so there is an allocation that's currently is there now, an extra allocation, which will stay. That allocation now will no longer be tied to the IB program specifically. So does that become an allocation that just is it, it that the super, is a superintendent um, assigned additional FTE that's not now connected to a board action or authority? It'll revert to, I mean, it. All of those are dollars in the general fund personnel budget. And in this circumstance, we would leave that position in place so long as it, as it is used for the instruction of foreign language at that scope. And then, so what are the metrics and outcomes that we're going to use if we don't have an IB program to, to demonstrate that that foreign language FTE there is effective, efficient, needed, et cetera. Is that? Well, we'd require them, uh, I believe uh, that would become an above baseline allocation because it's not a baseline allocation. So they need to justify it each year and they're required to do that in the spring when we issue allocations for the following year. So they need to show how it was being used, how they were conducting their foreign language program and what results they had from that foreign language program. Okay, so that, and that's what I wanted to get some clarity on. because I think before when we've talked about the IB programs, each time we've discontinued a program, they've come to the board because the board is the one that commissioned that these programs That's exist correct. in all these schools. And so kind of just wanted to be sure I understood what from a resource standpoint, 
now that sort of frees up that resource and it's really the, the superintendents at the We're simply going to redirect it to yet another strategic plan right. objective, which is foreign language instruction at the elementary level. Right. Okay. Okay. So then the, my last question, question, question related to that is knowing that that's an above baseline they can choose, how can other schools advocate to get to also get foreign language instruction knowing that we now have it in schools that aren't specifically tied to like an ib program or some other enhancement they, it, they certainly can make that request we solicit re input from the principals every year when we assemble the general fund budget uh, they have an ability to give input by level by elementary middle and high and then we put a group together comprised of all three and they reach a consensus on what they recommend to us that we ensure be included in the budget. The problem with that is we can't find enough foreign language teachers. If we had the money today to put a foreign language teacher at every elementary school, we'd probably still tomorrow have the same number or a month from now, the same number of foreign language teachers we have right now. So we cannot find enough of them. Right, which is why I asked my question the way I did. I'm not, I know already we've had that discussion. We don't think we can fund or we can teach foreign language in every elementary school so then it becomes driven by what's the local desire and the what does the local community want in terms of is that a priority for them so and right now it's kind of function of we don't want to go backwards but there's not really a good path forward to add foreign language and we're struggling to get those teachers uh, to staff the immersion program at Blythe and to staff the required foreign languages we already have in place at the secondary level there's not enough of them out there. So if there is an elementary school that that fits a priority on foreign language and would like to teach that, they would they would need to do two things as a local community. They first of all would have to see if if they had a way to find what that that special teacher that doesn't that's hard to, to find and hard to go by. And then they would have to ask for specifically a above baseline allocation for that. Or they can use the flex position that they already have. Okay. Okay. All right, that's helpful. I, you know, anytime we we switch, as a, this has been sort of a, as I said it before, IB is dying a, a long, slow, painful death in a lot of ways. So I just want to be sure that was a piece of it that I think was really um, helpful in the community and and created a lot of great additional benefit. So, okay, thank you. That was it. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just. Kind of following up on this this idea that you know for several years now IB seems to continually being phased out. We we still have a few schools that have IB. Are we are we providing any guidance to those schools to follow this similar process and consider getting rid of? I mean, most of the arguments made for disbanding IB were that it didn't con it conflicted with the pacing guides. It made it difficult for students to transfer. I mean, are we? Are we offering that guidance or are we waiting on schools to come to us? I believe Mr. McCoy's had that discussion with every IB school. If they have a desire in their community for that program to be revisited, we will gladly do so, which is what uh, what happened to Sarah Collins. Uh, so so we, are not, we are not encouraging schools to move out of IB, but we are we usually reminding just, them that the option yeah. is open to get We usually just check in each time. Um, when we did, for example, um, Heritage in Chandler Creek, we checked in with Sarah Collins, who at the time was three or four years ago. Um, things obviously changed three, four years ago. Um, so we always check in with the other elementary schools. The high schools, as you know, we went through a whole community process right. several years ago, and we feel like this community <laughs> spoke very loudly about what they felt like. So the elementary schools that currently have IB shouldn't see this action as a step towards them being forced to get rid of it. There's the only one that remains is Fort Shoals, and that, they seem to be very committed to okay. continuing it there. I, the, the other thing I would just say is that, you know, I see Dr. Burns here, and I, you know, one of the things we had heard in the earlier processes with some of the other schools is the decision to drop IB took the school by surprise. <clears throat> it took the community by surprise, and they weren't quite sure how to handle it. And I just, yeah, I really appreciate the last year of really reflective and intentional discussions that, that you've led with, with your staff and with the PPA and SIC and with the community. Um, even after the Committee of the Whole meeting, it was just really clear to me that the community has been brought in and brought along with this decision that it wasn't something that was given to them. And I, I know that's a an extra bit of work, and I, I really think that it's really 
it's really important, and I, I, I appreciate all the extra time that I took. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Ms. Mosley. Thank you, Mr. Meek. I just have a really simple question, point of clarification. So if the vote tonight is to remove or to abandon this, does this take effect immediately? Do they have to go through this school year under no, IB? No, it take effect immediately. It takes effect immediately? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I have a comment. Ms. Lavendas Wells. Yes. I'd like to thank Dr. Burns for acknowledging that there, there was no reason to continue a program that is not at the best interest of all of our students. And I commend you for taking that step in that leadership role and uh, so that our students can move forward in something else and that we do develop something greater than what we already have or had. And I look forward to greater things at Sarah Collins. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Lavendas Wells. Anyone else? Hearing not, the motion on the floor is to approve ending the IB primary years program at Sarah Collins Elementary School. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5.02, revision of board policy, JCAB, searches, student interrogations, and arrests. The recommended motion coming from the committee as a whole does not need a second, is to approve the revisions of board policy, JCAB. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5.03, revision of board policy JCAC, use of weapon detection systems. The recommended motion coming from the committee to hold does not need a second, was to approve the revisions to board policy JCAC. Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5.04, naming of Hillcrest High School weight room. The recommended motion coming from the committee to hold does not need a second, is to approve the naming of the Hillcrest High School weight room in honor of the Yance family. Any questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, 5.06, extension of COVID leave. The recommended motion coming from the Committee of the Whole does not need a second. Did you skip one? Did I skip one? 5.05. Oh, I marked it off, sorry. Electrical engineers. The recommended motion from electrical engineer indefinite delivery contract. Uh, the recommended motion coming from the Committee of the Whole does not need a second is to, let, to select firms one and two to provide electrical engineering services throughout the district. Any discussion? Any comments? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5.06, extension of COVID leave. The recommended motion coming from the administration is to extend the district's current COVID leave program through August the 31st, 2023, providing up to 80 hours of leave for documented COVID related circumstances. Uh, quarantine, isolation, or illness following the same parameters as the Greenville County School sick leave policy. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Meek. You all have approved this uh, two years in the past. Uh, we continue to experience absences due to COVID. Now, one reduction in that, though we left it in there because you never know when they may reinstate quarantine, basically that quarantine requirement has been eliminated. But we still have, uh, I believe, uh, Robin, we have had to date since the beginning of school, how many employees out with? 130. Uh, 130 out with COVID. Uh, so this extends that protection for one more year, so it does not count against the employee sick leave, and we would utilize ESSER funding to pay the, co the inherent cost in that, which would be the substitute cost. And we certainly recommend that we extend that benefit to our employees for another year. Uh, those uh, 
particularly having to continue to deal with the challenges, the ongoing challenges of COVID. Thank you, Dr. Royster. Before we put it on the floor, does someone have a motion? Mr. Lewis. I make a motion to extend the district's current COVID leave program through August 31, 2023, providing up to 80 hours of leave for documented COVID-related circumstances, quarantine, isolation, or illness, following the same parameters as the Greenwood County School sick leave policy. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion? Mr. Lewis. Uh, just two questions. One is, so what is our current COVID leave policy for those who are in isolation? I'm sorry to hear the very last so, part. For those of who are in saying. isolation, those who, who have COVID, what's the current DHEC guidance that we're using? The, are you talking the guidance that they receive? Uh, who, I don't think Janet's here tonight. Who's, who's most familiar with that? Because it has changed. I think basically now it's five days, Philip. That's right. They can return on the six if their symptoms are improving. Their symptoms are improving, or if they were to have a negative test. Right. And that's the same policy that we have for students, or is that that's just for adults? Uh, yeah, that, that's that's generally the that that is the general protocol now. And and currently, the the protocol for quarantine is that we do not require students. There is no adults. requirement at this point from DHEC for quarantine. We did want to leave that in there in case that were to be reinstated. Okay. Thank you. So we believe our COVID related absences should not, number of days absence should not be as great as past two years. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Ms. Laventus Wells. So Dr. Royster, <clears throat> when, when, you, when you say quarantine, isolation, illness, and documented, the documentation that they have COVID, where is that coming from? Where's the document? It would need to come from their physician or, or send us a, a positive test. Okay. And then I read somewhere where we're asking them to mask on day six through eight. Is I believe that's the guidance from DHEC when they return. Wow. Okay. That's not our directive. I uh, could not begin to try to answer that for you. Okay, that's what I didn't understand either. We'll be happy to ask that. that question, and if we get an answer from them, we'd be glad to send it to yeah, them. Yeah, that would be great, because sure. I don't understand their guidelines at all. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wells. So, what is our current amount of sick leave that employees get? I know it, does, it, it varies, right? Different. A nine, a teaching employee, so nine and a half months, uh, would be 15 days a year, and then it goes up proportionally. Uh, so I think 18 for a 12-month employee. So, and we're saying we're going to give them a, an additional, everyone would have an additional 80 10, hours. 10 days. That would be 10 days for our... Our maintenance employees are really the only people that are on an 80 hour, two week schedule. They're on 40 hour weeks. Everybody else is 37 and a half. But to ensure two weeks for everyone, <laughs> we did 80 hours. So we had 130 people out. Already. With COVID. Yes. So what do we typically have out? I mean, how does that compare to in a normal year, you're gonna have people out with something too, right? So is there any way well, for us to have a comparison to what? I can give you the number from last year. We had 118,839 hours of COVID sick leave total last year. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm, I'm less. I, don't, I do not have a comparison for you for other absences. <laughs> but I think in general last year, we had about the same number of absences as we normally have. The year before, I think we probably had fewer. Okay, and if I remember correctly, sick leave, the sick leave we give accrues. That is correct, with no cap. So it accrues, and so we're, and then it, when you retire, when you get to retirement, you can cash out. Your Ten dollars a day. Sick leave. Okay. So I'm just thinking about the implications of of. Because it's because it's if we're using ESSER funding, that's what ESSER funding is for. But then the the difference is, we're basically giving people extra days now. And I, and I think the the our rationale in looking at that is this is an absence over and beyond what 
the normal absences are for flu and colds and surgery and all those other things. So, you know, it would have certainly had a negative impact on people and their earned sick leave, and this mitigates that negative impact to them, particularly some of our people that have been with us the shortest amount of time. Even, even though we advance sick leave, if you start in your first year, you're only gonna get 15 days. Okay. Well, and that's why I was kind of going back to, we said we, get, we had 130 absences due to COVID illnesses, and I've just- That's people, to, not days. Right, so I was trying to compare that to, on an average day pre-COVID, how many people, how many people did we have out sick? I wouldn't give you we that, we can thousand. get that number for you, but we don't have it in here tonight. Okay. I think our normal attendance in a school year runs around 95%. So, so this amount of money, wh what is the calculated dollar figure for what that. this would? Sorry, it's uh, three point eight million. So it's potentially, I mean, a three point eight million dollar liability. But we, these are only these eighty hours would expire next August. So we. we our recommendations have consistently been from end of August to end of August. That way we have a good idea how the beginning of the year will look when we come back to you with it, if we ask you to renew it or not. Okay. Um, I, I guess my, how, how, many, how much extra funding do we have that we haven't allocated right now? We're, we're working on the number, a revised number for that because we have extra funds that we've not been able to spend simply because we couldn't get enough people. Uh, for example, some of the summer programs to operate them. Uh, we have interventionist positions that we added through ESSER that we've not been able to fill. So we're about to recalculate that and come back to the board with a recommendation of what we might do with the remainder of those funds. Okay, can you give me an order of magnitude? Is it 20 million, 30 million? We know there's probably 14, but there's likely gonna be more than that. Okay, and so this is, that's 14 plus 3.8? Is it like if we assign 3.8, that would be 14 above and beyond that? Or it's that's- I think you still got about 14, even with that 3.8. And there's, there's gonna be more than that. Okay. Well, I guess, I don't know at what point we just recognize that COVID is just like the flu, it's gonna be here with us. So I, 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 I don't need anybody to give me a hand for that. It's just, um, Knowing that that knowing that that that's going to be with us and and people are, we've we've got shortened time frames but you're you're no you're just as likely to be out with the flu that long as you are with anything else so in spending ESSER funds on this or committing them if there are better things for us to commit those funds to like mental health supports or some of these other things I just I'm trying to get a sense of what this impact is I guess the way we look at that is you're gonna have a certain number of absences added to the number of absences we normally have because COVID. It's adding to the number of absences. That's gonna cost us more money, whether you charge them sick leave or not, because we have to hire substitutes. We can charge the substitute to ESSER and give the employees nothing in return for that. That didn't seem to us to be the correct or fair way to do that. I think the employees should recognize some benefit from that ESSER money, not just the district recognizing a benefit from it. We can, we, can, we can back charge all of their absence to ESSER funding without granting them any special leave related to that. Which would put money back in the general fund, basically. Or, or keep us from having to add money to the general fund budget for substitutes. If we're increasing absences over what we normally have, then we'd be looking to have to add general fund money to the substitute bucket, which is gonna come out of local and state revenues instead of this federal fund that expires in 24. Well, I guess that's why I was trying to kind of figure out, like how does the 130 illnesses compare to what we would have in any other year? Because it's just, it's it's normalized a little bit and it's come down a little bit and people aren't sick but as long. Our, our experience, and we'll be glad to get you those numbers, but our experience is we still got all the other absences we always have. Now added to that, we have COVID absences for which there is a prescribed period of time you must be out. 
I'll yield the floor for now. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wells. Ms. Mosley. Dr. Royster, I just wanted some clarification. Thank you, Ms. Wells. You asked some of the questions I had, but going back to the protocols, what are we required? Like 130 absences now, and you said we had, I don't remember how many last year at this time, but last year at this time, we were being required to quarantine well yes. people and isolate differently and some other things. And those and so requirements right I can't, now are gone. Okay, so that's what, and so to Linda's question, the, the masking requirement, is is that a requirement we're implementing or is that just a recommendation? We are, we are providing that guidance to our employees or students as we get it from DHEC. Okay. And so are we accepting co positive COVID tests with the home test or does it have to come from a physician's office? Yeah, I was assume so. Now, that would be more Janet Loggy question. I'm sorry she's not here tonight. It's an attestation form that the parents submit with the with the home test that's done. If you, Mr. Dave, you need to speak in yeah. the microphone. Yeah, there's right? still the attest attestation form that parents could submit with the uh, result of the test to the school. Okay, so to Lisa's point, when the ESSER money is gone, because it's going to be gone at some point. Mm -hmm. You don't foresee recommending additional leave no beyond that no okay and don't know that we would recommend this again next year ESSER has until september of 24. okay i think that's all i have right now i may have more later but thank you Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Any further questions, Ms. LaVentz as well? So, Dr. Royster, what, what I, I think I hear you saying is COVID is the new flu because you don't hear anyone, you don't hear anyone dying from flu like you did before because COVID took its place. And so in the next year when ESSER funds are gone, we will basically be treating COVID like the flu. Is that what you're saying? And they would take their leave as they normally would for the flu. I, I would amend that in, in just a couple of ways. One, the flu ain't gone away. So right. people are still getting the flu and they're still absent because they got the flu. Right. So now you have COVID mm -hmm. uh, for which there is right now a compelled defined period of time that you need to be out. Uh, I, it, I don't see any debate that this is going to be here from now on. Now, severity of it will probably ebb and flow, just like the flu ebbs and flows. But without question, what will be gone at the end of the of FY24, the which is two, two years away, is this ESSER funding. And we would not at that point uh, make a recommendation that you extend additional sick leave it's just something that people will have to learn to absorb and best they can plan for, though many, many absences are, are not are not anything you can plan for. Right. There are some things that people take sick leave for that they can plan to do on days that they're not under contract, some, some things. But most people are taking sick leave for illnesses that occur without notice and require them to be absent or this illness of a member of their family. Right. So that's um, th that's sort of the difference. But I think we, you know, th this is something that's going to be around uh, forever. Yeah, just like everything else has been around forever. Mm -hmm. And um, and DHEC DHEC's rules are different than CDC's rules. So I, I just find it very interesting. So I look forward to seeing what the future has in store for us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wells. That, that would, that would basically that would basically allow you to have incurred COVID twice, which in our experience, that is relatively common. And it would cover both absences. After that, it's on your sick leave. 
and the 40 hours is based on that's the max hourly week for one a large group of our employees about 800 and something in number any further discussion on the motion on the floor miss Dillon. thank you would it be possible to circle back to this um maybe right after winter break to see if 80 hours is really necessary because if it's if 40 hours would be sufficient since you don't have to quarantine for two weeks you can just do your five days maybe the funding could be better spent somewhere allocated better somewhere else instead of being held up in reserve for these sick days would that be possible certainly anything's possible i would hate to extend a benefit to employees and then retract it before the end of the school year but the board can make that decision if they wish to to make that decision our recommended motion would be to adopt it as we presented it certainly you could amend that motion but and then of August, in August of 2023, if say half of the funds <coughs> weren't used, at that point we could still allocate it somewhere else? Re yeah, you reallocate ESSER funding at, at any point in the process when you've not used it for the purpose for which it was originally allocated. I, I think I'm, I kind of agree with what everyone else has said and that originally when this was approved, getting COVID once meant that you had to stay home for two weeks or if your child was a close contact and still healthy stay home for two weeks so that seemed really fair but now it's five days and go back to work is what I hear from DHEC or as soon as you're healthy again so I guess I sort of I sort of I just wonder about where the 80 hours came from also even though you said you're likely to get COVID twice but I guess time will tell. So anyway, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doolin. Any further discussion? Okay, we're gonna vote on the motion. On the floor is to extend the district's current COVID leave program through April 31st, 2023, providing up to 80 hours of leave for documented COVID related circumstances, which includes quarantine, isolation, or illness, following the same parameters in the Greenville County Schools sick leave policy. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Motion carries. Mr. Mead, did you say April or did you say all? I read what it said on there, April. Is it not? No, I thought August. I'm sorry. I, I can't read. No, I didn't vote on that because yes, it says August. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next item on the agenda is 5.07 waiver of student reduced meal prize. Dr. Oyster. You have before you a recommendation for the administration to waive for this school year, the reduced meal price for our students. We have the ability within the system to, uh, you all do, to waive the fee for reduced price. As you know, we went for two years where everybody Eight, courtesy of USDA, we've experienced a decrease in, in applications, which uh, is something Joe and his staff are working through. But in going through all that process, what we found, our revenue on reduced meals, less than $100,000. We have a very significant fund balance uh, in food service. We also believe that based on our projections for reimbursement for free lunch and our a la carte sales, we are probably going to cover some, if not all, of the almost $100,000 if you waive the reduced price fee for this period of one year. We believe that would be a great benefit to our families that are just above the level of income that qualifies you for free lunch. So you have our recommendation. Mr. Urban is here somewhere. Somewhere, there he is. Uh, somewhere, if he needs to speak to any of the particulars on it. Uh, but 
<coughs> we, we feel very confident that there will be, we feel very confident that there's no negative impact of any consequential number. And quite honestly, in our food service budget, uh, that 91,000 wouldn't be considered material in the budget, but we have plenty in fund balance to cover that, certainly for a year. And again, we believe based on our projections, we're probably gonna cover it through increased revenue. We have a recommended motion from the administration. Mr. Sailors. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that we waive the cost of the students reduced price meals for the 2022-2023 school year. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is 5.08, property acquisition for Stone Academy Elementary School. We discussed that in executive session. No action was taken. Uh, let me find it here. Dr. Royster. Thank you, Mr. Mick. Uh, uh, just two quick notes about this. Uh, as we mentioned previously, this will allow us to complete ownership of the entire block around Stone Academy, which can facilitate if we make a decision in the future to expand the school, which will facilitate that expansion. We are most appreciative to the city of Greenville for their offer to sell us this approximately 1.243 acres that is really literally dead center of the south side of the block that Stone Academy is located on, and again, completes our ownership of the entire block to allow for future expansion in what would be most likely the most logical place to expand the building. And we we'll still preserve the ability for the community to use the playground facilities at Stone. If they're not in this park where they currently are located, we would simply be moving them to another part of the property. And our, our practice has been to allow after hours use of uh, school playgrounds at the elementary level, unless or until there arises some issue from their use. Yeah, and that would be the plan there that the community can continue to access that. As it stands now, that park is not available to the community during the day. It's reserved solely for the school's use during the day by the city of Greenville. So the community loses nothing, but gains additional valuable property affiliated with Stone Academy. So we recommend the purchase of this property for the stated amount of a dollar. Thank you, Dr. Royster. There's a recommended motion. Ms. Leventus Wells. Do I need to make a motion? You do. Okay. I would love to because in all my years serving on the board, I don't think I've ever heard us purchasing a piece of property for a dollar. And especially in a landlocked area where property is at prime price. You have a motion? So, yes, I do. <laughs> just wanted to get that in. I'm so excited. To, uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the purchase of a plus minus 1.243 acre property adjacent to Stone Academy. So a motion is for a second. Second. We have a motion second. Now, Ms. Leventus Wells. I, I don't even know what else to say other than I love the vision of adding on uh, that will give us more area for Stone Academy. It serves the purpose of the community right there, and it serves the purpose of all of our students that are attending Stone Academy. So I thank the city for being gracious, and uh, and I don't know why we couldn't get it for 50 cents, but I'll, I'll go with the dollar. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Leventus Wells. Ms. Wells. We have, so this mentions, a, a, we'll do a lease <coughs> agreement so they can continue to use it. Do we have, do we put lease agreements in place, like at Sterling, or do we just have a, we have, some, lease we have some lease agreements in place for play, playground utilization. In other places, we have no agreement in place. But we just, we but our practice is right. to, absent a problem, to leave them open to the public. Okay, so I, I didn't know if this was some, if there was a different use agreement here that triggered us to say we want a lease agreement in place versus 
the way we've done the other ones. Like, like I said, Sterling, I don't think we have anything like that. I, I think the city just wanted to emphasize that they would like it to remain a, a park for the for the time being. Yep. And and and, and use and, outside when yeah, when non instructional years, hours. The, to get the kind of the size playground we have to have for that school, there would never be an area lesser in size than that area for a playground that can serve a dual purpose. Okay. Would that lease agreement come back to us, I guess, the terms of that, or is that just part of this since we pre uh, Typically, it would be a short-term lease agreement and it would not have to come to you. And, and it would be similar to, um, well, I, I would actually revise that. I think it will come come back to you. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. One year we do multiple, over one year you all approve. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion, uh, motion carries. Next item on the agenda, 5.09, physical education exemption. Dr. Royster. Get that information in your packet and uh, as as allowed under uh, FOIA exception was discussed in executive session because it applies to an individual student. Thank you. Uh, we have a recommended motion. Uh, Ms. Wells. I move to approve a physical education <coughs> exemption for one student at Malden Middle School. A motion. And a second, who seconded it? Thank you, Ms. Doolin. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Motion carries. That concludes our action items. I would like to mention that, uh, appreciate uh, uh, Ms. Bush's and expressions for the flyers tonight. I forgot to mention that at the beginning of the uh, uh, program. Next item on the agenda is 6.01 committee liaison reports. Who would like to go first? Miss Miss uh, Style, Dr. Styles, go. Yes, I had the honor of chairing the board self-assessment instrument creation, and we've had two very productive uh, meetings, and I'm proud to report that we do have a rough draft. And um, it was all based on research from the eight characteristics of effective school boards. And of course, our goal always as a board is to be as effective as possible. And we really, we really believe this self-assessment instrument will support us in, in being as effective as we can be and allow us to set goals for improvement. So we're excited about that and we'll be presenting that instrument at our upcoming Cal meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stiles. Ms. Wells. Yeah, so the... Um, Superintendent's Evaluation Committee met today to look at how we might um, make adjustments and improvements to that form. So we made a little bit of progress. We are not beginning to bring in something back to the committee to hold, I do not believe. But um, as we had sent something out previously, because there was some discussion about what you guys liked and didn't like about the instrument. So if you have feedback to offer, you need to do it this week so that we can incorporate that into the changes that we discuss. We don't, don't intend to make major changes based on this initial meeting that we have with the committee, but just hope to streamline the instrument and the process to make it a little easy, easier for us to navigate. So if you could, I'll ask Ms. Spitzer to send out a reminder maybe about Thursday um, for you guys to get me any specific comments that you want us to incorporate and look at. Um, and then the only other thing um, from my South Carolina School Boards Association standpoint, we do have the law conference. It's going to be here in Greenville uh, this weekend, so no one has an excuse for not participating some. It's always really informative. It's a good time to go um, you know, meet some other people that have some legal expertise, and you can ask them questions and see if what Mr. Webb tells us is um, <laughs> true. Uh, <laughs> Are the same, so I'm, I'm hoping you guys can can participate in that. It's, I don't know. I mean, Mr. Sailors might could tell me. I'm not sure it's ever been in Greenville. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been so it's certainly been more than 12 years ago. So. Thank you, Miss Wells. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. The advocacy committee met today. Uh, a couple of meetings that we're going to schedule for the future would be our meeting with the city of Greenville, uh, city council members, and mayor sometime in the fall, um, the meeting with uh, Travelers Rest and Greer sometime in December or January, 
and then we've moved back the meeting with county council and with the legislative delegation to probably February timeframe. So Julie will be trying to set up those meetings first and then we'll, we'll get those meetings to the board. But right now, none of them have been set. And then we intend to bring a couple of resolutions to the September or October board meetings based on uh, how they get approved by the committee. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda, 7.01 monthly finance report. We don't, uh, superintendent doesn't have a a report, but we'll be glad to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions? Hearing none, Ms. Leventis Wells, you have a motion? Yes, I'm, I make a motion to adjourn. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. aye. All opposed say no, motion carries. Thanks everyone.